Thanks for coming. My name is Vittorio Romeo. I work at Bloomberg in the London office. And today I'm going to talk to you about futures without type erasure and also without dynamic allocation. First of all, I'm going to tell you that I'm going to stay behind this laptop, not because I'm shy, but because I have the power of JavaScript. And I can do this and also this. So I'm going to highlight various pieces of parts of code snippets. This, this talk is full of code snippets. That's going to be useful to you know, follow along. What I'm going to talk about is building chains of asynchronous computations, like a CD-future composition, without using type erasure and dynamic allocation. And there are going to be a lot of templates. And as a disclaimer, this is kind of a experimental library. It hasn't been used in production before. And it's mostly an exercise in C++17 metaprogramming and trying to understand how futures could work without type erasure and dynamic allocation and if it's worth it. I have benchmarks at the end. So here's a sneak peek. This is what we're going to do. As an example, we're going to have a graph that begins from a leaf that simply returns hello. And then mm -hmm. we can attach a continuation that taking an SCD string adds world at the end of it. And then basically this is a composition of nodes that returns hello world. And the type of this graph, as you can see, is some weird expression, -like, expression template-like type that consists of a no node sequential, where the first node is a leaf that takes nothing and has a lambda. The second node is another leaf that takes an STD string and has another lambda, which kind of you know, is the behavior of the node. Another example, we can have something more complicated. We can have an all node that accepts any number of lambdas. For example, this could be HTTP get requests. And then what we can do is attach a continuation that takes a tuple with the data from the first and the second computation. And this will be invoked automatically when both of them are complete. And again, the kind of graph that we have in the type system will capture the fact that we have a sequential node of a node of all, where we have two leaves. And then the continuation of that is a leaf taking a tuple of data data and storing this lambda for its behavior. So as you can see, the goal is capturing everything into the type system and building up the graph as part of uh, this node namespace with various types. So once, let's begin from SCD future. And let's try to understand why I wanted to do this and if it's reasonable to do this even with the upcoming changes to the SCD future that would introduce continuations. So first of all, we have something in the standard library called STD async, which provides a way of running a function asynchronously. And what it does, it returns an STD future instance that will eventually contain its result. As an example, if we have STD async of launch async, which guarantees that the thing will be run in, uh, in the background, then we can sleep and print out world. And we assign that to a variable <coughs> f. And then we print out hello. This is guaranteed to print out hello world. And this is the way you can start an asynchronous computation in the standard library nowadays. <coughs> Another thing to take notice of is that I have one box links for pretty much all the code snippets in the talk. So afterwards, you can just download the slides and play around with them if you want to. Yep? That's a really quick burn to back off. <laughs> 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 and what you can do with future and async in, in 17 is easily model multiple tasks that run in parallel. As an example, we have F0, F1, F2. We start them with async, and they have this kind of graph where they can run in parallel. And then we have this barrier at the end that represents the destructor calls to all F0, F1, and F2. And this works. It's quite useful, but it's very limited. Because as soon as you want to model something a little bit more complicated, such as a dependency graph where you have F0 that then spawns F1, F2, and F3. And when all of them are done, you're going to start F4. And when F3 is done as well, you're going to start F5. This is really, really hard to express with the current version of a CD future, as we have no way of composing them using something like dot .den or when all. So when we have sequential composition, such as we start with F0 and then we run F1, what we want <laughs> to express is execute F0, then execute F1. And this implies nested async calls, as we might have different executor, and we want to keep going on the same executor. And the way you would write it nowadays is by having an explicit async call, does the first computation, and after it's done, you have an another async call 
as of the second computation. Yes? Doesn't the uh, second little tree block F0 until it returns? Uh, in this example, yes. So this is light code. is not exactly accurate okay. how the composition should be in practice. What I'm trying to point out is that we have no way of expressing this kind of thing easily in the standard library today. Yeah. So similarly, if you want to collect multiple features into a single one and then attach a continuation to that, it's not easy either with today's standard library. What we want to express is when all the AX features are completed, then execute B0. And a very naive way you could do this, again, this is slide code, so this is not a good way of doing this, but a very naive way you could do this is by having a future which in its body contains ACD async calls to the AX computations, then waits on all of them, and then starts B0 in the body, which is horrible, and is not the best way you could express this today, but I'm trying to point out that we don't have the right abstractions. So what do we want? from a CD future. We want abstractions that are intuitive and allow us to express composition easily. And these are already available in both future. You need to define some macros after, before including it and you will get dot then and when all. And we're also trying to standardize them and we currently have an experimental future that you can play around with, which is part of the extension for concurrent CTS, which I'm not sure how fast it's progressing. Okay, the comment from Bryce is that SG1 doesn't like that design, so it will not, will not be merged. There is a great talk from, by Anthony Williams at ACCO 2017, which is Concurrency, Parallelism, and Coroutines, and he explains these extensions alongside Coroutines as well, and it's really good to get an idea of what SG, SG1 has been working on and what might be in the standard, even if it's not in that particular format. So this is what Boost allows you to do. If you want to express sequential composition, so when we have F0 and then we have F1, all you have to do is provide your boost async, which gives you back a future. You do something in the body of async, and then you can attach a continuation by saying dot then, and you provide a lambda or any kind of callable object, which will take the future, th that the parent future as an argument, and then you can provide obviously your body. This is way nicer and works well. Similarly, if you want to express something a little bit more complicated, so a0, a1, a2, and then b0, you have this abstraction over here called <laughs> boost when all that basically allows you to provide any number of futures. In this case, I'm spawning three of them. And then this when all function will return a future that will be completed when all of the futures that you passed as arguments are done. And what you can do is obviously attach a continuation to it. So you can easily express in an intuitive way the idea of continuing from <coughs> a bunch of things when all of them are completed. So having dot then, when all and when any allows us to express future composition intuitively. And as you can see from the signatures that are taken from Boost here, what they do is they always return a future that you can compose further. So as an example over here, we have future t of then, which takes a closure and then returns a new future with the result of calling the future with the previous one. Similarly, when all is a variadic template function, it takes a bunch of futures and returns a future that takes a tuple of the parent futures as an argument. So as you can see, it always returns a future. You don't keep it around, you pass it to the to what <laughs> you attach in the dot then. I think you move it to the argument. Doesn't it make sense to have a function be um, an R value reference? Uh, so the question is would it make sense to have this function take an R value reference for the previous future? Uh, I think it would. Well, but the <laughs> member function be by default, R value reference only. So it's a, yeah, yeah, it's a member function by R value reference. You mean ref qualified? Yeah. Ref qualified oh, yeah, okay. Value. Yeah. 
Titus? Uh, that is the right to die. Which one? Mm -hmm. uh, if it is a thing that is destructively operating on the self, on this, this should be our value that's qualified. Because then when you see that in code, <coughs> then you are either operating on a temporary of the future, or you are calling a move on the thing, and then everybody's instinct for don't mess with a move from object kick in. It's just like we talked to John Stansley. It's like you don't have to have the key. Like all, all these future functions don't have to say, if row is, is, is in a bad state. Mm -hmm. It's just not in a bad state. I mean, and there's other places in the standard library where we're following the structure already. Like if it's a destructive do once operation, pick it our value that's called. I'm going to try to re recap this real quickly. We're discussing if this member function should be our value ref qualified. And the consensus is yes, because they're basically consuming the, the parent future. So they should only be call callable on our values. And the reason they aren't is because they weren't designed that way in the first place. And people don't agree that having the SED move a boilerplate was a good idea. But consensus is that they should have been our value ref qualified. Matt? Okay, so Matt's comment is that there are some implementation of futures like STL Labs futures that overload on const ref, ref qualifier and are by ref qualifiers and they do different things. So you can choose to consume or not. Peter? If I come back to the animation slide where you have the graph, I see that you have one feature which has two continuations, which is uh, the more complicated feature uh, graph. Uh, yeah, that one. Yeah, it's, <coughs> it doesn't really work. Yeah, that should be a shared future in that case. Yeah. So the comment is in the previous graph where it's very complicated dependency graph, if I have two continuations from the same future, that should be a shared future in order to make it work because you can <coughs> consume it twice, which makes sense. I'm gonna keep going. So the, what I'm trying to say is that the result type of the future composition is always future T, and this obviously implies type erasure. And additionally, future also uses dynamic allocation to keep track of the share state and so it requires both type erasure and dynamic allocation. And the goal of this talk is trying to see if we can avoid that overhead and if it's worth it. So let's try to think about an alternative design where we get rid of, the, uh, of that overhead. So type erasure is necessary only when the way you compose a future graph depends on runtime control flow. If you know the shape of the future graph at compile time, then you can encode it as part of the type system. If you were at Odin's talk yesterday, you have seen that, for example, with GUI, and that's a similar idea, right? If you know how these computation graphs should look during compilation time, why do you need type erasure? You don't. So this is what you could do instead. You could encode the shape of the graph as part of the type system. So imagine we have this leaf class that's a template class. It's using C17 class template argument deduction. And what it does, it stores a computation that represents a node of the graph. And then what you can do is you can attach a continuation to this leaf graph. And what it will do, it will return a more complicated type that encodes the fact that we have a leaf and a continuation, which is another leaf. And if you see the code over here, leaf is just a template class that takes a computation by forwarding reference and stores it inside. And the then member function over here, it takes a closure, it stores inside then, and it returns a new type of node called sequential that encodes the information of the parent and the child. So everything is getting stored in the type system, and this is the way we avoid type erasure. And again, we can only do this when we know the shape of the graph at compile time. So in this example over here, the type of F0 is just leaf of some lambda. And the type of F1 is a sequential, where the first thing is a leaf of lambda 0, and the second thing is a leaf of lambda 1. Make sense? So if you want to go and look at the when all example that we had before, you could represent it this way with my system. You could have a when all variadic function that takes any amount of any number of computations and stores them into F0, and then you can continue from F0. 
In this case, when all is just taking a bunch of lambdas and then returning a new type of node, maybe we can call it parallel, that stores every computation in a leaf and expands it in the type system. So we know during compilation time that this is a parallel node with a bunch of computations. And in this case, the full type of F1 will be a sequential because we have a dot then, where the first thing is the parallel node that we've just seen containing the leaves from 0 to 2. And the second thing is going to be lambda number 3, which is this STDC out over here. So if you played around with expression templates before, this should look really familiar. And what I'm trying to do is basically apply the idea of expression templates to futures. So type erasure can be avoided by encoding the structure in the type system, but what about dynamic allocation? So future T uses dynamic allocation because it wants to provide a shared state for the eventual result or exception. And also, if you have something like when all and when any, which might require some additional synchronization primitives, those might go in the shared state as well. And this is what it might look like. Imagine we have future, the promise, and the shared state. And if you're not familiar with this, basically the promise is the, the producer of the value and the future is the consumer of the value. You get a future from the promise and they are, they are both mm -hmm. aware of the share state and they keep it alive. It's like a share pointer to the share state. And you can imagine this share state as a reference count that keeps track of you know, when, when this thing should be destroyed. And then you might have a variant of value and exception that represents what the result of the computation was. So what if we don't do this and instead we store the, the state in place inside the final graph? Imagine like a CD string small buffer optimization, but for the share state of a future. So my idea is, let's forget about allocation, let's forget about share pointer. What we're going to do is we're going to add a restriction on how you use the graph object. The graph object must be kept alive until the execution is completed. And if we have that restriction, then we can safely store the share state inside the graph object itself on the stack. So if we tell our users, you must keep the graph in scope until the entire computation is completed, then we are free to store the share state inside the graph object. So imagine you have when all with two leaves, A and B. What we could do, for example, is have everything stored inside the graph object on the stack. We would have the first leaf with its own state that might be a variant of value and exception. The second leaf with its own state that might be, again, a variant <coughs> of value and exception. And then we will have the parallel node, which composes leaf of A and leaf of B. And as an example, one way we could implement when all is by having a counter that keeps track of how many leaves still need to finish. And that counter might go in the state of the parallel node, which is stored in place inside the object. If you get more complicated, you know, we have, we can nest these things arbitrarily. So maybe we have a when any, and our state will be a simple atomic Boolean to keep track of whether or not something has finished. Then when any is contained inside when all, which has the counter, and then we have a sequential, which kind of expresses the idea of sequential composition. And everything is encoded in the type system, and all the state required for synchronization and to store the results is in place inside the final graph object that you get after calling this expression over here. Arthur? Yep. So do you still have two sides, a promise side and a future side? Or just have one side? The question is, do you still have a promise and a future? No, I only have one side, which is kind of a, both of a future and a promise. Yep. Question is, what's the significance of keeping it on the stack as opposed to some shared pointer that is expressing something different? I w so the question is, why do you want to keep it on the stack as opposed to in the heap through a share pointer. I want to avoid the overhead of share pointer and see if it's, if it's worth it. So this is the, the, the main problem is if we do this, we need to guarantee that the graph must be kept alive until the entire execution is completed. So if we have this line of code over here where we're building our graph and then we execute it on a scheduler, if the schedule is completely asynchronous, so if it runs the graph in a different thread, it's on us to make sure that f 
lives long enough until the execution is completed. Bryce. Why do you feel that that should be on the user of the API? Uh, why do you feel that that should be on the user of the API? Uh, it, it doesn't have to. You can provide an API that by default makes sure that the graph will live long enough by using a latch or something like that. I'm going to show it later. But you probably want to also allow the user, for example, to uh, dynamically allocated, allocate the whole graph and have a SharePoint to the whole graph instead to every single piece. So it's for flexibility. Yes? So when you are composing these uh, lambdas together, the when, any, and all, et cetera, are they actually being executed while they're in construction, or do you have to let them know to start executing them? So the, the question is, when you're composing the lambdas together, are they executed during construction? No, I'm storing everything inside a graph object, and then I will use some sort of scheduler to start execution. Mm -hmm. And the schedule will be propagated down to every node, and every node knows what to do with the schedule. So small recap, type erasure, we can avoid it by having this expression template thing. We will encode the entire graph as part of the type system, and this requires that the graph shape must be known at compile time, and we can avoid dynamic allocation by storing the share state in place inside the graph object. And this requires that the graph must outlive the execution of all its nodes. So if you've been to one of my talks before, you know that there's a lot of code. And what I do is basically start from a very simple implementation and build on top of it. And we're going to do the same thing <coughs> for this talk. We will begin by implementing the leaf node, which is the very simple one, then sequential node the all node, and up until then we won't deal with any return value. Step four will be actually returning values and propagating them throughout the graph, which is quite complicated. Step five will be adding blocking execution, which solves what Bryce said. We will provide an API that blocks for you until the whole thing is done. And then step six will be the continuation style syntax, and step seven, if we have time, we're going to look at the any node, which is a little bit more complicated than the others. Yes? You said a couple times that you know the whole graph at, at compile time. So this wouldn't be valuable for something where you would sort of fetch a, a set of uh, data um, and then based on that set, is it an array or would it have to be a, a sequence of each row that uh, would sort of get to each row? That, that would not be no. useful for that. So in, the question is, if you had data at runtime that tells you how the, sh the graph would look like, this is not applicable. The idea here is providing kind of syntactic sugar for places where you know that you can do stuff in parallel without having to write it yourself or suffer the overhead of future, which might be you know, unnecessary. OK, so I lied. We also have a part zero, and it's the node concept. And the node concept is very simple. What we're saying is that all node types, so sequential, all, or leaf, have to expose this member function, which is called execute. What execute does, it takes a scheduler as, if it, as its first argument, and then it takes a continuation by forwarding reference. And independently of the node type, what will happen is that when calling execute, the stored computation in the node will be executed through the scheduler. So this could be simple CD thread detached, for example. And then we will asynchronously continue the execution with the then continuation when the thing that we scheduled is done. We will later improve the signature to support propagation of return values, but for now we'll just focus on making stuff, uh, on invoking stuff. And as I said, you can imagine scheduler for now as simply something that just creates a thread for a computation that attaches it. That's an asynchronous scheduler. But you could obviously be more clever and have a thread pool or whatever you want. And execute, as you can see, is L value ref qualified over here. Because it requires the node to be kept alive, it doesn't really make sense to execute a temporary because it will die immediately. And then we will lose the share state, which is stored inside the graph. So the first node we're going to implement is the leaf node. It's very simple. What it does is wraps a single computation f. It will expose execute because it has to satisfy the node concept, but it won't make any use of the scheduler. The idea here is that we can execute a computation on the current thread without using the scheduler. Now, when I gave this talk at the CCU, 
I got feedback that you might always want to schedule it even though you know that there is no inherent parallelism. And the way you could fix that is by providing a schedule node that you can wrap the leaf into and that will force scheduler to be executed. Anyway, an example usage of the leaf node is by is, is just constructing an instance of it, L, with some sort of lambda. And then what we can do is call execute on L, passing some scheduler and a continuation. And this will execute the lambda, uh, in this case, without caring about the scheduler. And then we'll execute the continuation immediately afterwards. So in this case, leaf is a template class. We're using CTAD to deduce the template parameter of the class. And the continuation is provided as a callback because we want to avoid unnecessary blocking. Imagine the case of when any, we want to continue as soon of, as one of the computations is done. So we need this kind of callback-based approach to asynchronously continue as soon as possible. This is the entire implementation of leaf, fits in a slide. It's not that complicated. It just stores a lambda using inheritance to make use of EBO. And we don't even need a deduction guide. It's going to be, the implicit one is going to be fine if we take by our value reference and move it into F. And then execute is going to satisfy the interface of any node. And it will simply execute the lambda that's stored <coughs> inside the leaf. And then it will invoke the continuation immediately afterwards without scheduling it because there's no need to do so. We know that this thing is a sequential node. <coughs> Makes sense to everyone? Is anyone here not familiar with CSPA 17 class template argument deduction? Okay. So the leaf node on its own is not really useful, but it's the smallest composable piece of the graph. So let's implement sequential node next. The sequential node takes two nodes, A and B, as inputs. It executes as A and then B. So if you imagine you have two leaves, L0 and L1, the first one prints a load, the second one prints world, then you can place them inside a sequential node by moving them in the constructor. And then when you execute the sequential node, you can provide a scheduler and a continuation. And what it will do, it will execute L0 first. Then when L0 is done, it will execute L1. And then it will execute the continuation you provided. So in this case, it will print hello world with an exclamation mark. <coughs> and this is the entire implementation. Again, it fits on a slide. It's a template class that derives from both A and B. It takes them by R value reference in the constructor, and it moves them into A and B. And now the interesting part is the execute function. What we're going to do is define the execution of a sequential node as executing A first, passing the scheduler, and the continuation of the execution of A will be this lambda over here that captures the scheduler, captures then, and captures this. And as a continuation of A, it will execute B with the scheduler and with the then continuation that was provided by the user. So if you imagine this then being the exclamation mark lambda, it will be invoked when we finish the execution of B, which was, the, which was printing out world. And execution of B will be invoked when we finish with A, which was printing out hello. So this guarantees a sequential execution that works if, even if A or B are, are asynchronous nodes. Yep? If you, were, if you were to be completely pedantically correct, then you would capture then as an L-value reference if it was an L-value reference, or move it into the capture list if it was an R-value reference, and then forward it into execute. But I, the slide code. Yeah. Jason. Um, so for context, why move instead of forward for your base classes? I didn't want to write a deduction guide. Okay. So. The question is, why do I move instead of forwarding for A and B? In this case, A and B are R value references, so they, need to, they don't need to be forwarded. No, they're not. Oh, yeah, they are. They are. Yeah. Yes, but in, if you want it to be completely generic, you will have a templated constructor that takes TA and TB and forwards them into A and B to accept L values. But I didn't, I didn't want to bother. Arthur? Yeah, 
yes, in, a, in real code, A and B, if they are the same type, you cannot inherit from both of them. So you would tag them with some integer stuff and disambiguate them. But it doesn't really happen. OK. So again, to make sure we are on the same page with this, the idea is that A is immediately executed. And the execution of B is passed as the then argument of the execution of A. And this allows non-blocking asynchronous composition. Because if we, we were just to say A execute, semicolon B execute, then we would have to block until A is done. <coughs> and this is very important for nodes like when any, because we don't know when, we know when the, the node is completed when a single computation is done, but we are also running the other ones in the background. So as an example over here, we have leaf L0, leaf L1, sequential of L0 and L1, and then we execute it. And if you want to see it in a graphical format, then the den of the first leaf is the second leaf, and the den of the second leaf is the user provided continuation. And those two leaves are connected together by the sequential node. Bryce? Yep. Um, so you're executing that here mm -hmm. and, and elsewhere you're executing the A operation on some thread here. And then what you're doing here is you're executing some, this rule wrapper operation, this lambda that, that goes and calls the second call also on thread zero. And then that's gonna go and execute this, uh, the continuation on thread one. Mm -hmm. So what you, that, this little lambda here, the bubble that you've introduced, between the A and B dependencies. So if, yes. for example, if instead of between two threads, if this was <coughs> between a CPU and a GPU, uh, that little bubble is unfortunate. Or if, it's, um, if you think about a sequence of three operations, um, uh, in, or if, if both of these were on a GPU, for example, that little bubble might be running on the uh, CPU, which would be unfortunate. So the, the point that Bryce is making here is that by having the lambda over there as my asynchronous computation, I kind of have a bubble that requires to be executed in the same place where A is being executed. You want it, like, I think what you want is you want to invert this API so that you, you have an API where you call, when this thing is done, then execute this thing. And that allows you to avoid the bubble. How would it look like? like um, so some, uh, some, some, an API where you say, I, I have a predecessor operation here, mm -hmm. and I have some work that I want to do. And once that predecessor is completed, I want you to do that work. OK, uh, we can talk about that later. So the comment is that this API might not be optimal because taking the callback as an argument to execute forces the Lambda to be executed in the same place as A, which can be unfortunate if, for example, the scheduler is trying to, move, is trying to execute A on the CPU and B on the GPU. <coughs> so why do I do this thing? Why do I care about passing B execution as the then continuation instead of doing it with A semicolon, B semicolon? Because if we have something like the any node, which whose semantics are as soon as any of the computations are done, then continue, then we don't want to block until the entire thing is done. We want to move forward as soon as one of them is done. So in this case, what we want to do is imagine F2 is the first one to complete, then we want to immediately go to the other leaf. <coughs> and if F0 and F1 are still completing in the background, we don't care about those. And you know, for leaf nodes, using this kind of approach with the lambda is indistinguishable from blocking. But for things like any, it really matters. OK, so that was the sequential node. Now we'll move on to the all node. And this will be the first one to make use of the scheduler because as we've seen before, the leaf doesn't care about it and sequential simply propagates it down to A and B, but it's not actually using it. So what the all node will do is it will take an arbitrary number of nodes as an input. It will execute all of the nodes in parallel and we will define completion of the all node when all DFS are completed. So what we can do is create a all node called graph we can create it from three leaves, A0, A1, and A2. Then we can execute it on some scheduler. 
passing a continuation, which is in this case is B0. And then we need to keep the graph alive until the whole thing is done. So we have a production ready slip over here <laughs> that will make sure the graph will be alive until it needs to be. We will fix this later. We will provide a nice API that blocks until everything is done. But for now, the slip is good enough. And this is how it works. So imagine the all node as a wrapper for the three leaves. And it also has some shared state, which in this case is an atomic counter uh, of how many computations still need to be executed. It's called left. And it is initialized to the size of fs, so to the number of computations in the all node. And whenever a computation is completed, it will atomically decrement left. So imagine this finishes, decrements, finishes, decrements, finishes, and decrements. And the last one to finish will invoke the then continuation, which in this case is the C out to B0. So the way it works is that the all FS node contains an atomic counter initialized to the size of FS. It keeps track of how many nodes need to complete their execution. And when it reaches 0, the then continuation of the all node is executed. And every node in FS decrements the counter upon completion. And since the nodes can be executed on separate threads, this whole thing needs to, needs to be kept alive until all the nodes are finished. And this is why we have the slip, which is temporary solution. So how do we implement this? Well, first of all, we are going to have a, temp a variadic template class called all, which takes the computation as template parameters, and we store them by inheritance, not just for EBO, but this really makes it easier to work with FS as a pack when we want to expand it inside execute. And then for now, you can imagine we have this atomic int as part of all state. We move everything into the storage, and then we have our execute that we're going to implement later. Bryce, you got a comment? No? <coughs> These are how the execute looks like. The first thing is we atomically store the size of F fs into the atomic counter. And I'm not doing this in construction because atomic construction is not atomic. And I had some weird issue with that. So I'm actually explicitly calling store when I begin the execution of all. And then what I have here, as you can see, I have round parentheses. This whole thing is a fold expression over the comma operator where I'm folding over the fs pack over here. And what I'm doing is basically capturing every single computation as by reference inside this lambda with the name f. And then I'm passing this lambda to the scheduler. So I'm, I'm asking the scheduler, please execute this lambda however you want. And what I'm doing is inside the body of the lambda, I'm calling f.execute, which defers the execution of a node to the actual node type. And I'm passing the scheduler. And the continuation of the execution of f will decrement the counter by one. And we'll also check if it was the last one to decrement the counter. And in that case, it will execute then, which is the continuation of the all node. So I'm going to break this, this down in the following slides, but is the general idea understood? I really like that fold expression. OK, so this entire snippet, as I said, is a fold expression over the comma operator. And in short, what it's doing, it's scheduling the execution of every f in fs. And what we're also saying is that as soon as an f is done, we want to decrement the counter as part of the then continuation of f. And the last f will execute the then continuation of the all node. Make sense? So this is an example expansion for two hypothetical A and B nodes. Imagine we have only two nodes in this all parallel node. The first thing that would be expanded is a store of two in the left counter. And then we will have this come over here. That's the expansion of the fold expression with two calls to the scheduler, where the first one captures A by reference, the second one captures B by reference. 
and each one of them will execute the corresponding node attaching the same continuation, which will decrement the counter and call then if it's the last one. <coughs> So what we have so far is we have a leaf node that wraps a computation into a node, which allows composition. Then we have a sequential node that given A and B will execute A and then B. And then we have an all node that given FS dot dot dot, it will execute all of them in parallel. So with these tools, we can already model arbitrary for can join computation graphs. In this case, we can have A0, which is a leaf, then attach uh, all and then another leaf, and we will connect them together with the sequential node. Bryce. So maybe DAX, 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 yes. Yeah, just, yeah, the comment is, I mean DAX, directed graphs, acyclical graphs. Jason. Would you mind going back just to the extension just for a second? Absolutely. Okay, you good with it? So the, com the comment is it might be a good idea to extract the continuation lambda to some name variable and use that inside the expansion to avoid creating lambdas over and over. It might be better for the compiler or worse. We don't know. Don't know. But it's an interesting comment and something to consider. So as an example, if we want to model the thing we've seen on the previous slide, we will use this beautiful nested syntax where we have a sequential node of a sequential node of a leaf continued by an all, and then finally we have another leaf. And that allows us to express any arbitrary DAG using this kind of expression template thing. So we cannot still return values from a node and pass them outwards, which is kind of a bummer because we really like to do that with STD future. So that's what we're going to deal with next. So the execution of any graph always begins from a leaf. Even if you're starting from an all node, the all node itself will contain leaves. So we always begin from a leaf. So leaf nodes must be able to both produce and accept values. Imagine you have a sequential node. The first leaf will produce an int, and the second one will accept an int and produce a string, for example. Composition nodes, such as the sequential one or the all node, must be aware of what values their children are producing because they need to be able to store the results somehow. And again, this information can all be encoded as part of the type system. So let's begin with leaf. Every node will have an in type and out type type alias. The in type represents what the nodes get in and the out type what the node produces. <coughs> In the case of leaf, we, we need to be explicit about what it's going to produce as we have no way of deducing it. So what we're doing it is adding a new template parameter over here, in, which will be alias set to in type. And the out type can be deduced by simply computing the result of calling f, which is the computation stored inside the leaf, with uh, the input type, which is in. So now that we had this new in template parameter, we still want it to play nicely with class template argument deduction, otherwise creating leaves will be pretty painful. So class template argument deduction doesn't support partial deduction, so we need to provide a deduction guide that will inform the compiler how we want this thing to be deduced. And we also still want to be able to use lambdas. So my, my solution here is to use a combination of boost callable traits and some very simple metaprogramming to extract the first argument of the call operator of a lambda and give that to the leaf as the in argument. So as you can see, we're gonna have a deduction guide that takes f, which is the lambda, and the in input argument of the leaf will be deduced by looking at the first argument type of the lambda's operator call, and the second type, which is actually the lambda itself, will be just the dkt of f as here we have a forwarding reference. And the first argument t alias is just a call to a city tuple element t with 
the second argument of boost callable traits arguments of f. In this case, it's the second argument because the first <coughs> argument is the implicit this parameter. So what's happening here is that args t returns a tuple containing all the argument types of f. And if f is a callable, the first type is the type of the object itself. And we're just extracting the actual argument. <coughs> Louis? Uh, yeah, so you mean taking f by value? Or? Uh, I mean, why did you extract the upper branch? Because that's the upper branch as opposed to just, uh, just, just saying f, right? Oh, um, the question is why do we extract the operator parents instead of saying f? I think that's what args t requires. Uh, I think args t, I think all that says in every stack is f. Okay, so okay, okay. I this. Know this code might be simplified by simply passing f to first arc t instead of extracting the operator code because the comment is that arc t should be able to handle that properly. Maybe I just didn't try that. I don't, I don't remember. Bryce? Will, it, will this work with, uh, if you make that change, will this work with pointers to member functions? Or do you need to uh, so would this work with pointers to member functions? No, I honestly didn't care about the use case. If you wanted it to work with PMFs, you would have to either you know, provide another deduction guide that does the right thing, but it's not really useful. Louis? But it would work, right? If you, if you don't say, if you don't say you know, ampersand F operator parent, then that just means it's letting go of this handle, and I think you can pass anything that is just one of the pointers or like whatever the second thing is that you're doing. OK, so the comment from Louis is that it would probably work if I just pass F to first arc T. Because again, callable traits, args t should be able to handle anything, including pointer to member functions. You, you're probably right. I probably just didn't try that. So this is a way we could simplify it and appreciate the, the comment. OK, so the cool thing is that now we don't pay any extra syntactical overhead on the user side when we're creating leaves. So we can just say, this is a leaf that has a lambda that takes an int. And the deduction guide will allow us to deduce this as a leaf with int as the int type and the lambda as the second type. Similarly, if we have a string, it will be the use as a leaf that takes a string and has a lambda. So this is pretty cool. We don't have to uh, either create a make leaf function or force the user to explicitly specify int or string. The deduction guide does that for us. Jason? Uh, leaf has a constructor that takes the lambda okay. and a deduction guide that deduces both the, the in and the lambda. <coughs> we still have a problem which is execute. Execute still looks like this and the issue here is that now the lambda takes an argument so what do we pass as our argument inside execute? And if you think about it, leaf can be you know, the beginning of our graph, it could be in the middle of our graph, it could be accepting another value. So we don't know what this thing is gonna get. So the only reasonable way of making this generic enough is to add an input <coughs> parameter in execute and have the parent of leaf deal with that. So what we do is we change the, the concept of, the, of execute for nodes and we accept an input parameter. You have a question? Is there any way of doing a leaf that doesn't take a parameter? That would be a leaf of void, but we know that void is annoying. So the way I solve this in my library is by having a type that's called nothing and some metaprogramming ugliness that converts void to nothing and returns nothing instead of void. And it kind of simulates regular void. Okay. It's not great. And there is a proposal about regular void that should fix this by making void act like a normal type in the language. I don't think it's moving forward anymore. Does it anybody know? <laughs> okay. So Matt. So Matt, which is the author of Regular Void, claims that someone is working on implementation and might come back to committee or not. Anyway, so what we're doing here is since leaf might accept a value we need to accept it as part of execute so that the parent of leaf can provide it to this node. And we're changing the concept of our nodes to 
and every every node type will have this input parameter now. What we do is instead of calling the first one and then the then continuation, we will invoke the lambda stored inside the leaf by forwarding whatever we got as an input, and then the result of this thing will be passed to the continuation, which is then. So we are composing them by uh, piping the output of the lambda as the input of the then continuation. Example usage is we have this leaf over here that takes an int and returns the int multiplied by two. Then we can invoke execute with some scheduler. We pass 10, 21 as our input, and then we provide a continuation that takes an int and prints it out to a CDC out, and this will print out 42. So this is the new implementation of leaf. Still fits on a slide if I make the font small enough. And in this case, the only differences are that we have the in type, out type. We have this new deduction guide, which could be simplified, which deduces in for us from the lambda we provide to leaf. And then our execute is piping together the result of the lambda as the input of the then continuation. Everyone clear on this? Okay, so all the other node types will require the same modifications. They will have to expose in type and out type, accept an input parameter in execute, and execute the child nodes by passing the input, and then invoke the then continuation by passing the result of the above operation. So let's apply these changes to the sequential node. So this is really simple. We have in A and B as inputs. And we know that the input type of the sequential node will be the same as the input type of A, and the output type of the sequential node will be the same as the output type of B, because we're calling A then B. <coughs> so in graphical form, imagine that we have this leaf that takes void and returns int, and then we sequentially compose it with this other leaf that takes int and returns string. The types that sequential node cares about will be an input of void and an output of string. So we're abstracting, abstracting away what's happening with the leaves and just extracting the initial and final result. And what we, what's above in this slide is what we had before, and below is what it becomes after the changes. As you can see, we're adding an input parameter over here. And then when we're executing A, we're forwarding the input to it. In this case, FWD is just a macro for forward because there's a lot of forwarding and it gets annoying. And the continuation will now accept some return value by forwarding reference, which is the result of A is passed to the continuation. And then the result that's accepted in the continuation will have to be passed to be executed as its input. So this is how we propagate a result from A to B in the sequential composition. Any questions on this? So usage example, we have a sequential node of two leaves. The first one takes an int and returns <coughs> int multiplied by two, and the second one just converts it to a string. Then we can call graph.execute with some scheduler, 21 as our input, and then a continuation that accepts a string and prints it out to a CDC out. And in this case, this will correctly propagate 21 multiplied by 2, convert it to a string, and then print it out. <coughs> and this is the final implementation of the sequential node. It's very similar to the one before. The only difference is basically take the input, get the result, and pass the result as the input of B. And that's pretty much it. So leaf and sequential now support asynchronous propagation of values. All is a little bit more complicated because we have multiple computations that run in parallel which need access to the same input value. So we cannot actually pass it directly from the stack as it's not guaranteed to outlive the parallel computation. So when we, basically here what we're doing is we're passing input directly from the parameter on the stack because we are sure that this execute will live long enough for A execute and B execute to finish. 
In the case of all, that's not really the case. It might be that we reach the closing brace of the execute function before the computation has completed, and they might still want to access input. So we cannot directly pass it from the stack. So what we could do is copy the value in each computation, but that might be expensive and it's unnecessary. What instead we could do is make use of the storage that we have inside the graph itself. So what we can do is simply store the input value inside the all object <coughs> and then provide a reference to that in every computation. And since one of our requirements is that the graph has to leave until all the computations are done, this is guaranteed to be safe. So this is an example of what I mean. If we, didn't, if we simply pass input by capturing it by reference in the default expression that builds up the calls to scheduler, then there is no guarantee that we don't reach this closing brace bef uh, before all the computations are done. So this might actually become a dangling reference as the stack frame of the execute call will be destroyed before we finish the executions. <coughs> so the alternative is extending our state inside the all node. And we won't only have a single atomic counter which keeps track of how many things needs to be finished, but we will also have an instance of int type that will be constructed with the input we get in execute. And children nodes will simply refer to the underscore input which is stored in the all node instead of having its own copy, which could potentially be expensive. So first of all, we need to compute the int type and out type for all. It's not really that complicated. In this case, I'm just using common type so that I have a place to expand the input type of fs as I expect them to be the same. And then uh, the output type will be a tuple because we want to capture every single result from all the leaves that are inside the all node. So that will be a tuple containing the output type of every single leaf. In graphical form, imagine we have three leaves inside the all node. They all take an int as an input, and they return an int, char, and float. So the input type of the all node will be int, and the output type will be a tuple of int, char, and float. And this will be our new share state, which is stored inside the all node. And what we'll have is the int type input, which is what we will get from execute, and we can store it there so that all the computation can refer to it safely, the atomic counter, and then some constructor that, given the input, forwards it into the input data member and also does the atomic store for us. So now what we have is the input type, output type, share state, and what we can do is provide aligned storage for the share state as we know that we only want to construct it when we begin execute, and it can be destroyed when all the computations are done. And then we can have an output type variable that stores the result of all the computations. So that, so that will be a tuple of all the results. And in this case, state will be constructed when calling execute and will be destroyed on completion, and values will be fill it, filled during execute and passed down to the children nodes. It won't be destroyed, so it's not part of the share state, as all the children need to be able to refer to it afterwards. So if you think about it, what we're doing over here is kind of having the same semantics as share pointer. We have a reference counter, which is our atomic int, and then we construct it and destroy it depending on runtime control flow. And we're kind of having some sort of share pointer that's in place on the stack by using this combination of the aligned storage and the atomic int. Titus? Is your primary reason for the aligned storage is that you're storing value directly, that you want objects to be destroyed <coughs> as soon as the computation that relies on them has, uh, has completed? So the question is, what's the reason for the aligned storage? And one of the reasons is, yes, to have them destroyed as soon as the computation is completed. The other reason is that in type might not be default constructible. Double in the end, wouldn't there be a, a different conversion to when uh, 
hasn't been <coughs> the argument to use the lambda as a different type. So the question is, w wouldn't common type allow lambdas with different input types to be used as uh, the children of all because it allows implicit conversion? The answer is yes. I'm not sure whether that's a problem or not. I would probably, um, in, in a real implementation, I would probably use some sort of thing that makes sure that everything is the same type. I use common type here as I didn't want to have extra code and I wanted something easy that's in the standard library. But yeah, it, we, we should make sure that everything is the same type. So let's, let's go to the all execute method inside all. What we're going to do first is construct the share state into the alliance storage. So this dot .construct syntax is just uh, doing place menu inside the alliance storage. And in this place menu, we will pass the input so that it gets constructed and the children nodes can refer to it. After we construct the alliance storage, we will schedule all the children nodes and every ch child node will fill one of the values inside the tuple with its own result. And finally, when the last node finishes, it will invoke then and destroy the state on completion. So that will basically call the destructor of the share state in the alliance storage. So what we need to do, we need to fill the underscore values tuple with the results of each node. Therefore, we need some sort of index so that we can call the correct std get to get the right value. And unfortunately, our beautiful fold expression will have to be replaced because we need this index. So we need something a little bit more powerful. We don't only need to know about the current computation, but also the index of the current computation. So imagine we have this thing, which is called enumerate types. And what it does, it takes a bunch of template parameters over here and invokes this lambda by passing the index as an integral constant to the first argument and the type as a type wrapper to the second argument. So if you're familiar with boost HANA, T is basically a type wrapper that stores the type into a value. And as you can see here, I will just be an instance of integral constant of int of I, which is the current index of the iteration. And T is the type wrapper that stores the current type, and we can retrieve it out of the wrapper. So if you want to see this in another way, it's kind of uh, iterating over FS at compile time, keeping track of the current iteration index, and t is the thing we're iterating on. <coughs> so now that we're doing this, what we have to do is schedule all of our computations. In this case, what we can do is retrieve the current computation as we did before inside f, which is captured by reference in the lambda. And the way we retrieve it is by first unwrapping the type that's stored inside t. So T is the type wrapper that contains an alias which uh, stores the type. We can unwrap that alias and get the type out of the wrapper. So in this case, it will be F0, F1, F2. And then we can study cast ourselves to F0 ref. So we will get one of our base classes. If you remember, what we're doing is uh, deriving from all the FS computations. And we can capture that as F. So in short, F in the lambda evaluates to this, casted to the types in FS of the current iteration. That's what this thing is doing. Now, once we have F, what we can do is execute it on the same scheduler, and we can pass the input this time as an L value because it can be shared between all the computations assuming that it's const, and the continuation will again be a lambda that captures the continuation of the old node and accepts a result for each function f that's going to be executed in parallel. One more step. Now what we need to do is, remember r is the result of one of the computations. We need to place that result in the correct spot in the tuple so that children of all can access it later on. So how do we know the correct spot in the tuple? We have an index over here, which is given to us by numerate types. It's an integral constant, so we can access std get with the decal type of i default constructed, which is a silly way of saying use i as a constant expression. Inside values, which is our tuple, which is currently empty, and then we can assign 
the value inside the tuple by forwarding the result that we got from the F computation. And then we still need to decrement the atomic counter, which keeps track of how many things are left. And the last computation to finish will destroy the share state to make sure that the destructor of the input type is well behaved. And then we'll invoke the then continuation by moving the tuple of values into it. Any question on this? Usage example, we can have an all node that has three leads. They all take an int and they return x, x plus one, x plus two. And we can have a sequential composition of this all node with a leaf that takes a tuple of int, int, int. And then we can sum all of the values inside the tuple. And the way we can start the execution of this graph is by calling dot execute with a scheduler an input type zero, and then providing continuation. In this case, we're just gonna print out the final result to SDC out. Now we have zero over here. Zero will be given to every leaf, so they will return zero, return zero plus one, zero plus two. So the li this leaf over here will have a tuple containing zero, one, and two, and the final result will be three, which will be printed out to SDC out. So a recap of how, how this thing works. <coughs> we have this all node which has an input and an atomic counter stored in place inside the share state, which is constructed when we call execute and destroyed on completion. So conceptually, you can think of this as a share pointer that's stored on the stack and is reference counted from, uh, by the computations that are executed in parallel. The output values are stored in a tuple, which is a tuple of every return type of the children this again lives in place inside a node. It is filled by enumerating over fs dot dot compile time. And the last computation to finish will invoke then with a tuple. So we'll pass the tuple as a continuation result. And if you wanted to, while we enumerate fs, and we know that maybe our scheduler is simply a thread pool or an std thread detach, we could say if i equals to zero, then don't schedule the current computation. So we can save a thread by executing one of the computations on the current thread, which is something that you might want to do depending on what kind of schedule you have. So we were talking about this before, but I've carefully avoided using void in all of the examples because it requires extra care. And if you're interested in seeing how this works in the experimental library, which is called Horizonte, which is implements all of these nodes, then the idea is that I have this nothing type and convert void to nothing transparently so that the user doesn't have to care about this. Any questions so far? We, this is kind of the bulk of the talk, implementing these nodes and understanding how to propagate the return value. Now we're gonna get into some nicer details such as avoiding the need for the sleep and having nice dot then continuation syntax and then any if we have time. Bryce. You haven't talked about set memory at all. And yes. You started off by saying features are essentially a variant of evaluating exception. Yes. So the question is, the comment is, you haven't talked about exception handling. This lives in a world where we don't have exceptions. And if you want to propagate an error, you will use an algebraic data type, such as expected or optional. So it's not a really a re realistic, it's a utopistic world for me. But a real implementation would have to handle exceptions and instead of simply storing the result, we'll also have to store any possible exception that was thrown by the computations. So it will be more complicated, but more flexible. Yep. So the, the question is, is standard get guaranteed to be thread safe if you're accessing different elements? I asked this on Stack Overflow with the language lawyer t tag, <coughs> I think a year ago or something like that. 
So there is a lot of discussion there. I think the general consensus was it should be thread safe, but it's not really that well specified. Maybe Bryce has a better answer. If, if the thing that you're passing in is a cons uh, uh, reference to a crib bolt, then you're fine. But if it's a, a mutable reference and you're going to mutate it, or if, if by access you mean modify, um, yeah, you're not good. If you yep. by access you mean So this thing over here, Bryce, this line over here, this gets executed in different threads at the same time. It is guaranteed to be different indices, but it's the same tuple. So the question is, is this legal? <laughs> it's good enough? <laughs> Have a vector of five elements. You can have five different threads yeah. and you upgrade right. it to one of those elements. Even if it's taking executes, it does not matter if it's the same cache line. It will be slow. It will not be a great. Th that's why I have a cache line tuple. I also don't care. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like there is no rate to this, yeah. so long as the elements in the tuple are themselves not crazy. Like, if the elements in the tuple are referencing are references to the same underlying thing, then yeah. then yeah, you're you're off in the trouble state. But like, so long as these tuples keep so up the same value, you're fine. The reason that they should be fine is because I actually you're you're doing you're exiting you're doing multiple things here. One, you're exiting a simple object. That's fine. And that's fine. Yeah. But then you're also exiting objects contained within that tuple, and those are different objects. That's fine. Yeah. You're good. Okay. <coughs> so in short, this line of code is well defined and behaves. Properly, it's thread safe. Yeah. If you were assigning the whole tuple, then you would be in trouble. Yep, yeah, yeah, absolutely. If you had some sort of debugging tuple that contrary to your policy that the, you're in trouble. That such a tuple would not be a, a, a valid implementation of this method. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, I'll follow standard type that says compatible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So this is annoying, we don't want to sleep. Can we do better? Yes, we can. We can use a latch, which is available as part of the SED experimental namespace and, or in boost. And basically, if you don't know what a latch is, it's just a counter plus a condition variable plus a mutex. And what it does, it blocks the thread the latch is, is uh, the weight is invoked on the latch on until the counter reaches zero. So in this case, imagine we have a latch initialized with three, then we can have three asynchronous computations and each one of them, the calls cone down on the latch so that decrements the counter and then we call l.weight on the main thread and this is guaranteed to block until the counter reaches zero. So this is what we'll do for our own uh, graph. We will create a sync execute abst abstraction that given a graph will block until the whole thing is completed. So this is what it looks like. It takes a scheduler, a graph and a then continuation. It will create a latch with counter of one it will then call execute on the graph, passing the scheduler, nothing as the input, which could be void. And then the continuation of graph.execute will be a lambda that takes the final result and calls the user-defined continuation with it because we, we still want to propagate it asynchronously, counts down on the latch, which unblocks it, and that's fine. And what we will do is we will wait as part of the call to sync execute, and this guarantees that the graph will live long enough, maybe. Oh, uh, Matt. Well, yeah, yeah, but how does that interact with any? Because presumably any start kind of early returns and you've still got some threads running off doing their own merry thing. It, <laughs> it, it's, it's more complicated. <laughs> I hope I'll get to it. I have 13 minutes, but otherwise you can find me later. Bryce. Uh, you so if you call sync execute in a in a thread within a thread pool, then you would basically prevent that thread from being usable until the whole thing is done. Right. And so, what if what if your thread pool has one thread in it and everybody else is? Yeah. If your thread pool has only one thread and you call this in your thread pool and you are scheduling things on the same thread pool, then you you're screwed.
So now that we have this thing, we don't need to sleep. We can simply say sync execute instead of graph.execute, and this will allow us to guarantee that the graph object lives long enough for this thing to finish. So it's kind of providing a deterministic lifetime for the graph. Jason? Um, so the question is, is the constructor of the graph tied to the system threading? No, the only place where threading is done if you want to is the scheduler. And the constructor doesn't take the schedule, we pass the schedule what we call execute. So CPU is just a branch? Yes, absolutely. And it all gets in line. Well, you use it, it's not really a good idea to do that. Um, the question is, what's the compile time like? Probably bad. Um, I haven't benchmarked compilation time, but one thing I can tell you is that you could type erase the graph once at the end and then use that type erase version instead of recompiling it every single time, which is something that we discussed in Odin's talk as well. So this still allows you to do type erasure, but you have control over it. You don't have to type erase at every single node. You can type erase the whole graph put it in somewhere that doesn't need to be recompiled, and that would kind of circumvent the issue. If that makes sense. Yep. So the graph, I, I don't know, the way I'm understanding it, the graph is just like a structure, right? And you pass it to sync execute, and then sync execute figures out how it wants to execute? Yes. So what about the compile time of sync execute to figure out what it's doing? So the compile time of sync execute, if you pass in a large graph, will obviously scale negatively with the complexity of the graph. But what I'm trying to say is that as long as you have something that conforms to graph's interface, so as long as you have something that simply you can call execute upon, then it doesn't matter what the type is. So if you were concerned about compilation time of a particular graph, you could create your graph somewhere, <coughs> type erase it, and then pass the type erase version to sync execute. Make sense? Okay, so that was a solution for the sleep thing. Now I'm going to ask you which one is better between the two. If you, say, if you say one, you're wrong. So we want to implement the second one, which is the dot then syntax, which allows us to read from left to right and so <laughs> expresses very intuitively the chain of computations. It's not hard to implement. What we can do is add a then member function to every node type. We could obviously abstract this away by having inheritance or whatever. But imagine we simply add it to every node type. It will be called then, returns auto, because it will return the complicated graph type. And it takes an X, which is uh, either a closure or a node by forwarding reference. And the semantics here are that if X is a node, then then we'll return a sequential node of a CD move of this and x. Otherwise, if x is not a node, so if it's just a lambda, it will do the same thing, but automatically wrap into a leaf for you. So we prevent the user from having to say leaf, leaf, leaf all the time. We do the wrapping for them as a little bit of syntactic sugar. And we can implement it with if const expert. So the idea is that we simply check if the thing that is being passed in is executable. So if it exposes a dot execute method that conforms to the node concept, if it does, then we simply return a sequential node of ourselves and uh, x forwarded. Otherwise, we're going to assume that this thing is just a callable object and we're going to do the same thing, return a sequential of ourselves and x but wrapped inside of a leaf. So we are automatically doing a wrapping for the user as syntactic sugar. And is executable can be implemented with the detection idiom or other techniques just to make sure that X exposes execute or not. So now we can write something like this, which is a little bit nicer. We can have a leaf of then, which is the start of our graph. Then we provide a closure without having to say leaf that just multiplies the value by two. And also we can use then with a complicated node such as all. And in this case, we can provide two leaves that do different things. And then we can attach a final continuation that takes the tuple and computes some final result. 
So it is a nice way of making the syntax a little bit nicer. If you wanted to, you could also provide versions that do the all thing for you as well without having to provide leaves, but it's just a syntactic issue. Yes? So the question is, are you going to have dot .catch? If this thing supported exceptions and correctly propagated them all the way down, then dot .catch would be a great idea to allow error handling at the end of the chain. Yes, Bryce. So uh, dot .catch can be used in addition to other types of configuration. Uh, that takes that call history from that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we talked a little bit earlier about that then. You can do R write that qualifies. So if you have an API like that, where you have separate separate dot catch method from your dot bin method, and you can attach one or the other, but not both. Yeah, um, not just mm. not Yeah, well, the, 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 job, the JavaScript you know, for it is you can, you either have, have a method that has uh, both success and error, where uh, you catch in both success and error method, or uh, you have only success or only error. Yeah. Um, I mean, and then just saying that, that you, need a, you need a slightly different API uh, to make this work. I, I don't think it would be problematic with this particular API because you could do whatever you want. Like you can pre-process the graph, find the catch node, put it somewhere. It's really, yeah, I, I, I take that. You're right. It's really usable. Yes, but in more general case, that probably isn't true. Yeah, you could just chain, you could chain through the dot dev and you just have to go use, go use the catch. Yes, but you need to know where the catch is from every child node because you might want, you, you know, as soon as you have an exception, you want to go to the catch immediately, right? That's something you could do as well, instead of propagating yeah. the exception down. If, so you, if you think of it as actually that the then is actually a short version of it, and that what you have is, is uh, one that actually takes two lambdas, one for success, one for error. Mm. Yes, that would be another, like the comment is you could also I have a dot catch that behaves as if then took two lambdas, one for <laughs> success and for error, and just abstracts away that idea. Uh, Chandler. I, I feel like a lot of the API confusion here stems from attaching this dot bin to a list cell API is the least tight. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like it would be a lot cleaner if you, if you kind of recognize you have a nice non-tool API with the potential and the least and the different kind of like direct building, and then build a co totally separate parallel builder API where, where you're not going to have these uh, R value, L value lifetime confusion because it's a builder <coughs> API. It's, it's, it's supposed to work in this particular way and you can then write a nice fluent series of like state transitions and then state between uh, uh, you know, callback, callback states. All those kinds of things make sense in a, in a full builder kind of API that's kind of separable from the direct API. Makes sense. So Chandler's suggestion, which I agree with, is that the confusion that we have here is due to the fact that we're mix and matching this idea of the fluent.dan API with the uh, implementation details such as leaf and all nodes themselves. So a better idea and a more flexible way of doing this would be having a completely separate builder API that's fluent style, which produces something like leaf, all, et cetera, et cetera, but it's completely separate from it. It's not mix and matching the two things. And it could also be a good idea so you can pre-process the builder API and kind of apply optimization and stuff like that. Yeah. Bryce. So the, the problem with taking two configurations instead of what you tried to suggest it is because you want to, you have like an error ba uh, value lambda and error lambda and you want to move capture from the uh, in scope where you uh, attach. Um, and you want to have that move with capture value at build lambda with lambda so that's kind of thing that works. You have just one function um, and it's really old. I'm not going to repeat that. Sorry. Matt? There's a bigger problem that catches over the keyword, so you can't have dot <laughs> catch. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Cannot have dot catch because catch is a reserved keyword. Co underscore catch. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I have three minutes. I will not be able to explain this in, in all its details, but I'm going to try to give you the intuition of how the any node works. So, the problem here is that we want to continue as soon as possible without having to wait for all the computations at any to be done. But we also need to know when all of them are done so we can correctly clean up our graph with sync execute. So we can have two paths, the paths of execution and the paths of cleanup. In this case, the any node will do the same thing as all. It will store an atomic counter with all the left things 
and then have input type and output type as before. Now, if for the all node, the output type was a tuple, for the any node, it will be a variant because it's one of them. And this is you know, quite elegant and makes sense. And in this case, we compute it the exact same way. Instead of having tuple here, we have variant. And not gonna bother with this. So the idea here is that to make this work properly and know, determin determin uh, know when we can clean up this thing, we need to pass a cleanup parameter to all the execute methods of the nodes, which is another callback, another continuation that will be executed potentially at the same time as then for all the node types, except for any, when it will be executed when all the computations at any are done. So we kind of are following two paths, the paths of execution, the paths of cleanup. And what we do here is basically propagate, execute over and over. And in the case, let, let, so this, this is inside any's <coughs> implementation. And any execute will, again, iterate over every f that's uh, the, in the fs dot dot computations. And it will decrement the counter. And now it has two things to do. If it's the first one to finish, so if it's the first computation to finish in the any node, then we are going to set the value inside the variant. So we have a result. And then we can invoke our continuation by moving the variant into it. And that's great. We are done. But we also need to be able to inform the entire graph object when every computation is done. Because if we have sync execute, we want to block until all the computations are done. Otherwise, some of them will be still running in the background and the graph object will be destroyed. So we also need to check if we are the last one to decrement the counter. In that case, we can clean up the aligned storage state and then invoke the cleanup continuation, which is different from then. So any invokes then at a different time than cleanup. Every other node will invoke then at the same time as cleanup because completion is the same as cleanup for them. Any is different in this case. And so what we do in sync execute is that when we call graph, graph execute, we need to pass two things. We need to pass the then continuation, which will invoke the user defined continuation and decrement the counter. And then we also need to pass a cleanup continuation, which will decrement the counter. Now the latch itself cannot be initialized to one. It has to be initialized with this weird cleanup count thing, which is basically a, traverses the graph at compile time and counts the number of any nodes. So this is saying, if I have four any nodes in my graph, the latch will be initialized to four plus one, which is five. And one decrement will be from the dot then, and the other four decrements will be from the cleanup calls in the any nodes. And if you want to see this graphically, this is kind of what it looks like. Imagine we have this graph F0, which is an all of two any's. And the first thing is the all computation, which adds the counter two plus one. Then we have a zero and a one, they have two any nodes. Since there are any nodes, we know we have to increment the latch by one. And then the cyan path is the path of execution, which we'll call dot then, which decrements the node. And the white paths are the paths of cleanup, which will be executed when the, all the computations inside any are finished. And we'll simply invoke cleanup to unblock the latch. And that's kind of how it works. So last thing. Runtime benchmarks, this is important. I benchmark this against Boost Future using a thread pool or a simple thread detached thing. And this is just uh, runtime execution. In this case, if I have Boost Future with a single node versus my library's uh, leaf node, we can see that it's always faster because obviously we don't type erase anything. It can be completely inlined. So this is not really useful. What happens is that as soon as we add more continuations, then the gap between boost future and my library gets bigger and bigger. In this case, if we have a dot then b dot then c, then we see a huge gap over here. And the reason is that dot then in my case is completely in line and doesn't have to run on separate threads. So this kind of API where the scheduler is optionally invoked depending on whether or not you need parallelism can by default make this a little bit faster. Now I should mention that the x-axis of the graph is telling you about the, type of a the time of a simulated computation as part of every node inside the chain. And it's tr trying to simulate an uh, IO-bound computation 
So we're saying something like, if your computation inside one of your nodes takes more than 10 milliseconds, then there is no reason why you would use this overboost feature because the gains are very small. But if your computation is very short, so it's like 0.05 milliseconds, then if you use my approach versus boost future, you will get a runtime speed up. Titus. So that sort of brings up the question that's been at the back of my mind, which is, is this a suggested area of development for like production code, or is this a science project? Uh, it's definitely a science project. The conclusions that you can see from this benchmark are that if your computation time is short enough and you want to express some kind of parallel computation as part of a tight loop without having to do it manually and want to use some syntactic sugar such as this one, then you can uh, have a benefit in runtime performance by using something like this compared to Boost Future. Bryce? But if these are all being, like, this is effectively single threaded and you are executing A dot okay. A then B then C. Let, let's look at this one. I have A, B, C, D up to, uh, up to H. And I'm comparing it against Boost Futures deferred, which runs it on the same thread. In this case, there is still a gap. And since we are running it on the same thread, so we are not doing anything differently from Boost Future in, term, in terms of uh, behavior, then my conclusion is that this small gap that we have between Boost the Future deferred and my approach is due to the type erasure and dynamic allocation. Yes. And the single thread case doesn't really speak to me. Yes, absolutely. On the multiple thread case, the avoidance of the, the type erasure and the memory allocation is completely dominated by the fact that it's used, there's a context switch in there mm -hmm. and in which, like, so I, I don't see where the fail occurs. Okay, like, so mm -hmm. the observation is that with this kind of syntax, you can do more things such as not spawning threads because you know the shape of the graph. And in that case, you will get performance benefit, but it's just because it's single threaded. However, you don't want to use this thing in a single threaded scenario because it doesn't really make sense. It's an abstraction that allows you to express uh, parallel computations. And the comment is, even though you might see a sh very small benefit due to the, the lack of type erasure and dynamic allocation, then that is completely dominated by the fact that you have context switches in your multi-threaded scenario. So is, is it worth it? And you know, that was a question that I tried to answer as part of the talk. My conclusion is no. Okay. <laughs> Bryce. So I think you come to the wrong conclusion. Um, and, I'll, and I'll give you that quickly. That I'll give you the use case that you're looking for. Let's say that you want to defend a bunch of work through some sort of accelerator. And each API call that some work was expensive. So that particular API preferred to be sending work in bulk. Without his lazy model here, he built this with like sig future, like concurrent PTO v1 uh, futures. How many times do you want work in this continuation chain? Once for each dot van. With his model, you build up the entire batch of work you want to do, and then you can send it over in one, one call. We recently announced that an API that is essentially my isomorphic to this. So I'm, I'm fairly confident that this design is um, very useful. Now it's, it's not useful in all cases, but it gives you the ability to have your execution graph ahead of time, to be able to optimize it, um, and then to be able to amortize your, the, the, uh, the calls to your scheduler API. I think that brings up basically what David was saying last night of if you have a particular case, like you can build a particular data type that's going to handle that case bonkers well. Like if your issue is, I need to not dispatch work too often. Like okay, um, it like also gives you don't need to build a whole asynchronous it computation also framework to happen in one thread. That that is that, that is one step, but it also gives you the opportunity to optimize the graph and to be able to reuse the graph multiple times. So in this. In this slide here, um, how many times are you calling, uh, how, many, how many trials do you do for each? I think 100,000, something like that. Okay, do you, but do you scale it for the amount of computation time? 
Uh, no, it's 100,000 trials with different computation times, but it's always 100,000 yeah. times. So let me try to recap what's been said. First of all, I want to clarify that my conclusion of this is not worth it. It's when we're discussing against uh, boost future in a scenario where you want to have multi-threading with you know, a regular scheduler, which is either detaching or a thread pool. If you have different types of scheduler, Bryce's comment was that having the information about the chains as part of the type system could allow you to batch the work in advance to the scheduler, and that might be a huge benefit if every single API call on the scheduler is expensive itself, and also having the graph information in the type system could allow you to do some pre-processing on the graph and optimize it before executing it, which might be a good idea. Tidus' counterpoint was, sure, but do you need an asynchronous framework to do that? If you know what you're trying to do, you can just represent it yourself. And then that's kind of, you know, it's very subjective. If we have this, then why not? But it's, it's very subjective. Chandler. I don't actually agree with Titus yeah. that the default to string reallocation should be dominated by a context pool. I think that is an interesting theory, but I don't think we have enough evidence to know that that would be the case in practice officially. And so I'm actually still quite interested in this just in the normal necessary case. OK. I so think we're, we're overestimating the cost of context switches and the number of context switches that could be required. Mm. And I think we're underestimating the number of allocations that will end up being the same. And TensorFlow is an application that is under dependent. In fact, they have this model. So Chandler disagrees with Titus. It says that even in the normal multi thread scenario, we might be overestimating the, con the cost of a context switch and maybe doesn't happen as often as we think it is. So actually having less overhead due to dynamic allocation and type erasure might still be useful in that scenario. Uh, Jens. My, my, okay, my real, the question is, how much better would it be if my implementation didn't use tuple, because tuple is everything in the same cache line? My real implementation uses a cache line tuple, which aligns every single element to a different cache line. So these benchmarks over here are using a cache line tuple. Uh, Arthur? I have more, I have more, I have more. I have more benchmarks, but I have, I, but I have no more time. So please find me later. Thank you.